I'm calling this video Tips from a First Time Boat Builder. This is part one of a two-part series. I'm showing the hull build out up until the point I flip the boat over so that the interior can be completed. I knew I wanted to build a small wooden fishing boat that could accommodate a 10 to 20 horsepower motor, hold about four or five people. These are pictures of boats I thought resembled my goal. If you intend to build a boat, it's a good idea just to go out on the internet and search for wooden boats, wooden boat construction. You get a lot of good ideas. After some searching, I found a few good sites that offered plans. I settled on a site, Spira International, run by a man named Jeff Spira. He seemed to have a large base of satisfied customers and a good history in the business. On his website, you'll find a variety of boat plans, all categorized by boat type. I settled on one in the Power Dory section called the 14-foot Seneca model. He has pictures from customers both during and after construction. And he allows a partial preview of the plans to see basic dimensions and required materials. I'm not affiliated with the site at all. I do want to point out that the plans, although affordable, are in no way detailed to the point of holding your hand. You will need some basic construction skills and be able to fill in the blanks, so to speak, as you build. I consider myself a moderately skilled do-it-yourselfer and even I scratched my head a few times. But when all was said and done, I had a boat. And here's a look at the finished product. Once you're ready to start, the first obvious questions are, what materials will I need? Where should I buy them? Do I need special wood? Do I need special glue? Do I need special screws? It can be daunting. And what you'll find is a dozen answers to each of those questions. Of course, many of these answers depend on the cost and what you can afford. For my boat, I decided to use Douglas fir for the frames. It was available and a quick search showed me some of the advantages over common pine. More than a few decisions were made based on availability. Shelves were often bare. One decision I made early on was to use construction adhesive over epoxy whenever I could. I've used similar products before and I trust their strength and durability. I spent the extra money for the upper tier stuff because there is a difference. This PL Max Premium ran about $11 per tube versus the $4 or $5 for the standard stuff. And even though the label says for indoor and outdoor use, the details also say not for marine use. This doesn't scare me because they're referring to submerged or constantly wet areas. My boat will see none of this but plenty of this. One of the first steps is to build the frames or the ribs of the boat. Most plan sets don't come with full-size layouts of the plans, so you have to scale it up on your own, draw it out on paper. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. The Spira plans lack some detail here, so it was very time-consuming to lay out. Wanting a stronger glue bond, I routed out some randomly placed channels where the pieces would join. I did this so the glue would have pockets to fill and grab onto once dried, in addition to the flat surfaces. The directions for the adhesive recommended adding some moisture to the wood when humidity was below 25%. I let the spray soak in for about 10 minutes. The two main advantages of using the adhesive over epoxy are one, no mixing, and two, there's no running or dripping of the glue. After applying the glue, I used a scraper to spread the glue around and force it into the routed channels. Notice the lines on the wood marking the join boundaries. And also, there's plenty of time to work with this adhesive. It dries fairly slowly. You can also see that I pre-drilled at least two of the four holes for screws. Also note the line that I marked where the chine log will be inserted. 
You don't want to put screws there. I'll explain more about that in a bit. After everything's screwed together, it's time for a little cleanup. I should point out that you want the frames as precise as possible, especially the size and angles, but don't get too concerned about messy edges at the joins because that'll get cleaned up later. I've been throwing around a few boat terms, and it might be good to cover some of that right now. This is not my boat, but if you follow the cursor arrow, you can see where I'm pointing out the frames of this particular boat. The long center plank that runs down the middle of the boat is called the keelson. The keelson is inside the boat as opposed to a keel which is on the outside of a boat. The chine or chine log is the long board where the floor meets the walls of the side of the boat. The shear clamp is the long board that runs along the outside of the top edge of the walls of the boat. And the stem post is where everything comes together in the front. Here's a detailed view of the chine and a frame. Notice the frame is notched to accept the chine log for a flush fit. This boat design requires eight frames. Each frame is unique, so I had to draw out each one and lay it out. It's not hard, but it's time consuming. It sure was nice when it was done. In case you're wondering, this project took four months of fairly regular part-time attention. Many of those days were interrupted by a full-time day job, but I got to see plenty of nice sunsets. These plans are for a flat bottom boat. Typically you have water drainage cutouts at the keelson, and the water drains towards the back of the boat through these cutouts. I decided to try something on the fly to help the water drain away from the sides of the boat towards the keelson. This was to put a slight angle on the floor towards the center. I cut a continuous wedge starting one inch high on the end and extending it 14 inches towards the center keelson notch. Here you can see the frames after being cut. They have a very slight bow shape and here you can see the scraps that were left over. I'll jump forward in time a bit to show you the effectiveness of my idea to taper the bottom edge of the boat. Here you can see the water running away from the sides like I had hoped, so I'm happy with the decision. I should take the time to introduce you to my assistant, Olive, who faithfully stood by, ready to help at any moment during this entire project. Earlier I mentioned that the frame joins would get cleaned up. This shows how notching for the chine and cutting the wedges did just that. You can also see that I'm pointing out how the adhesive clearly filled the channels that I routed before screwing the frame pieces together. I'm using the cursor arrow to point out small pockets filled with glue. The next step is to build a support structure called a strong back, which will be used to attach and position the frames and support the bolt hull as you build it. The Spira plans lay out the strong back showing recommended materials, but once again they lacked some details that required some interpretation. Since you build the hull upside down, the frame supports decrease in height towards the front of the boat. Here I've positioned the frames onto the strong back. I attached each one with two screws. I use some temporary bracing to get the frames lined up in according to plan. Here in the boatyard, pillows are hard to come by. I started laying out and building the transom, or the back end of the boat. I used three quarter inch plywood and two by fours per the plan. A big challenge when building a boat is bending wood. I tried what I thought might help by soaking these pieces in my hot tub. I had some success doing this. I would say it did help. 
I soaked parts of the Kielsen chine and shear clamp overnight in 105 degree water. When I pulled them out, I wiped the surfaces dry. Working the desert climate, I wasn't concerned with having too much moisture in the wood, which would affect the glue bond, because everything dries out quickly in 15% humidity. Another day in the books. The plans call for 3 8 inch plywood on the sides and half inch on the bottom. Once again, based on availability, I settled on using half inch all around, which, of course, half inch is never half inch. It was 15 30 seconds, or 0 0.046875 of an inch to be exact. Some will undoubtedly wonder if I used marine grade plywood. The answer is no. I used the best grade I could find at a <clears throat> reasonable price. Once again, this will be fine for my intended use. I don't believe in spending money where it's not needed, and sometimes it's best just to get stuff done. I didn't want to wait nine months for some boat in the Pacific to build a boat. That just seemed a bit crazy to me. Here you can see me applying the PL Max adhesive to the chine, frames, and shear. This highlights the big advantage of using the adhesive over epoxy as it grips on and is easy to apply. I made sure to cover the contact areas with a generous amount. This step took two tubes per side. I used three to attach the bottom. Overall, I must have used at least a dozen tubes on the boat. Note here the metal brackets I attached to the shear. This was to support the side plywood when I brought it against the frames for fastening with screws. I worked alone on this project and I only have two hands. I cut the side plywood slightly larger rather than trying to make a pattern and cut it to exact size. I knew I'd probably mess that up anyway. Here you can see the overhanging edges that will be trimmed later. After cleaning up the excess, the shape of the boat was now plainly visible. This was a significant milestone. I was happy to temporarily leave sawing, bending, and drilling behind. The day's cleanup was always rewarded with a nice sunset. The mornings were a good time to work on the boat too. You never knew who you might run into like this one here, who often came to check on the boat's progress. My assistant, on the other hand, didn't always see it that way. I got the sense of some jealousy, but I let her know her job was safe. I ordered a new 9.8 horsepower outboard for the boat. I unpacked it and put it on a self-made rack where I could test it and take accurate measurements for fit. After trimming, sanding, and fairing the plywood, it was time to fiberglass. I got most of the supplies online from a place called Total Boat. They seemed to have everything I needed and had it available. I used what's called 1708 biaxial fiberglass cloth on the bottom and standard 6 ounce cloth on the sides. Prior to that, I added a 4-inch, 6-ounce strip of fiberglass tape to the center seam and around all edge joins, including the transom. Here, once again, I'm pointing it out with the cursor. Here's details showing what the 1708 looks like after being laid down, epoxied, and dried. Note that I overhung the edges for a smoother transition and strength. The surface has a cloth-like texture which will be filled and fared later. I made sure to overhang enough to cover the screws where the sides meet the chine. The 1708 biaxial cloth is heavy duty and gets its strength from mixing a standard weave cloth with a crisscross bi-directional cloth. You apply this material with the crisscross pattern down. It takes quite a bit of epoxy resin to fully saturate the cloth when laying it down, but you need to do that. 
I had limited experience with fiberglassing prior to this. The one thing I learned is to not leave mixed epoxy waiting too long in any container. Pouring it out and spreading it out gives you time to work with it. If left in a container, the heat reaction can be extreme. The glassing took several days. I used slow drying epoxy for extra work time, but even so, you have to let things cure before sanding and recoating. I also decided to add an additional layer of 6 ounce cloths to the bottom since I had enough materials left over. As the days ticked by, I was approaching the end of month number two. As it turns out, we had an unusually wet summer. It slowed things down, but was welcome due to a recent drought condition. To prime the hull and fare the cloth weave, I used a two-part epoxy primer. I really liked the way this went on and dried. I used a short nap, nine-inch roller. I laid down two coats with light sanding between. At this point, the boat really looked like something that might actually float. For the sides, I used a one-part polyurethane paint. The color I chose is called Aqua Mist. I put on two coats with a roller. Although I didn't, I would recommend thinning this paint slightly if you want a smoother finish. Also, this paint dries very slowly and should be put on in thin coats and allowed to fully dry between coats. Otherwise, the undercoats will not dry. I think thinning the paint would have eliminated this orange peel look you see here. Getting up early is not a bad thing. You get rewarded with views like this. For the boat's bottom, I used another Total Boat product called Underdog. It's an anti-fouling paint, good for salt water, but probably a bit of overkill for my boat. I went off the plan's stated water line, then eyeballed a straight tape line where I thought it should go. One thing I'll say is no matter how many of these you think you're going to need to build your boat, Double it. I can't tell you the number of times we searched for just one more clean brush or roller before heading back to the store. But finally, the paint was dry and the hole was done. It literally looked like an upside down boat. I shared these pictures with a few friends and most of the comments were, Wow, looks great. Amazing job followed by a you're almost done with me thinking if they only knew <laughs> it was just the halfway point in reality but like i said more sunrises and more sunsets no hurries no worries in part two i'll continue with the project the interior build out was just as fun and challenging as the hull it's also where you get to customize things to your liking. I hope this video entertained and inspired. Until next time.